What's up, Managing Madrid Podcast listeners? This is Kian Sobani. What you're about to listen to or watch, depending on where you're consuming the content, is a clip from last night's post-game podcast. So shortly after Real Madrid beat Atletico Madrid in the Copa del Rey quarterfinals, Matt Wilty and I jumped on Zoom and we were joined by a bunch of patrons on the call. We did video breakdown analysis of the game. We did questions face-to-face on Zoom. That was a ton of fun and broke down that game to its core. The full episode, we touched on everything. We talked about the performances of everyone, including Eder Militao, Danny Ceballos, Eduardo Camavinga, Rodrigo Goish, uh, Luka Modric, Tony Kroos, Vinicius Jr., and everything surrounding him. We spoke about the starting 11, the subs, and also big picture stuff like Fran Garcia's deal and general Copa del Rey things, and a ton more. The clip you're about to listen to is about Carlo Ancelotti's Once de Gala, and more specifically, the midfield, and whether or not Tony Cruz and Luka Modric should be starting together when the season is on the line, and generally speaking as well. So, we're going to jump in. Again, if you want access to the full episode and a ton more bonus content, including the mailbag, which is going up on Friday this week, go to patreon.com slash We'll see you on the inside, and we'll welcome you with open arms in the Real Madrid family. And let's jump into today's clip. Enjoy it, and thanks for listening. I miss Chua many, by the way. You mentioned Chua many. I'm, I can't wait till he comes back. He provides such good coverage on defense, and his ball progression has been really good. And he kind of clarifies some of the, like you can kind of see there, especially in that first frame of this game. You can kind of see that there is still a little bit of confusion in who's the anchor. It, it switches, it's interchangeable. Sometimes it's a double pivot with Modric up top and and Kamavinga and Cruz as a double pivot. Sometimes it's Kamavinga, sometimes it's Cruz. But there are times where Atletico make a single pass behind our midfield line and they just break it. And you, you can't really see who's the guy who's actually covering it. The clarity of having too many in there, it just makes it easier getting the role straight and and who's actually playing at the base and who's actually defending in transition and who's responsible for defending those cutbacks and defending for the wingbacks. I think it makes the job a lot easier. Your point about Cruz and Modric is, is interesting because this to me, this was a big game. Like between this and the athletic game, for example, this is the one where Ancelotti will play his own city gala because this is Copa del Rey quarterfinals against your city rivals He's going to play what he believes is his best 11. Forget about what is the best 11, what he believes is the best 11. So I still think he has Mordech and Cruz in there. And I don't know, Matt, like it's it's weird because Cruz still to me is having an amazing season. I don't, I think he's been a little bit, had a drop in form after the World Cup. And Mordech, this was just a couple months ago where he was doing amazing things in the World Cup. And he's understandably just, it takes time for him to get back. He had, he had a better second half, by the way. But it is interesting to kind of like look at how this transitions into the younger midfield eventually. It reminds me a little bit of Putrogenio Raul. It's like that kind of phase where Putrogenio is older. He's, he's still there in the squad. But you have this 17-year-old kid, Raul, who's like, is he ready? Should he be actually starting games at this age? And it turns out the answer like, is, yeah, I think he should. He brings something fresh. And I just don't see any scenario now where Kamavinga should be dropped. Frankly, I- I'm not even sure you could bench Ceballos, who's playing out of his mind. The-, the most underrated story of this season, to me, has been the fact that this is Real Betis, Danny Ceballos. It's him. This is the guy we signed. This is the guy who was supposed to be by 2020. Three, part of our midfield. Like, this is the guy we had projected. This is, it's kind of like, it reminded me of also Teo Hernandez. Remember when we signed Teo Hernandez? We projected him to be an absolute menace of a left back. A guy who just is like a bowling ball on the left flank, just bullies people, gets the ball, carries the ball from lightning, lightning quick from point A to point B, north, south. And then he just had a little bit of a dip in form, had some bad defensive miscues that lasted for a couple of years. Loan since didn't do well. Finally goes to Milan, finds a home there. I feel like Ceballos and Teo were kind of on that same timeline. Teo, we kind of gave up on and he he went away. He's probably not coming back. Ceballos, we kind of still have. To me, this is kind of the guy we were supposed to sign. I think this is a underrated story. This is the guy he was supposed to be. I'd, I'm not even sure you can drop him at this point. But I do wonder 
what Carlo does in a big game. We got Liverpool coming up in February. It's hard to see if Modric and Cruz are going to start together. Maybe the dynamic, like, and, and you have Chua Meni, who is a guaranteed starter. Someone's got to miss out. I kind of like the idea of having Modric come in off the bench because he's a guy who suits any game state. You need to slow down and control it. He's your guy. You need some experience, a veteran presence in that moment. He's your guy. You even need someone to progress the ball and be press resistant. He's your guy. I kind of like him off the bench in that scenario, but I'm curious to know, like, what at what point do you decide this? And right now, what is it to you? Like, what's what's the best eleven? If Chuomeni is back, assuming, what do you do? Yeah, I mean, I, Kamavinga's I not starting at left back. I'm sorry, in our Once the Gala. I love no, no, him. We're gonna, yeah, this is, there's no. going to be a massive Kamavinga segment, and he did. <laughs> it was amazing today. But he's not going to, he's not like your left back, you know? So he's going to play in midfield. Yeah, I mean, I don't envy Carlo Ancelotti right now. I guess it's a good problem to have, though. I mean, he's got, he's got <clears throat> selection headaches. And I don't, I honestly don't know. I think, to your point, like Cruz and Modric just a few months ago um, being in phenomenal form, I still think that maybe even if they're in top form, like maybe it's just the profiles don't fit for what we're trying to achieve against these bigger knockout games. Because think think back to the Champions League. Like we were overrun in, against Chelsea, against Man City, against all these teams. And it wasn't until we made the changes at, in the second half when we actually started to play the Madrid way and like take more of the initiative and start creating opportunities. So, and we, we question it, like we question it the other week saying, do we now go from the control in the first half to the rock and roll first and then bring in the control? And maybe you kind of ease into that transition. Like, I don't think we can keep some of these kids on the sideline for much longer. Like Rodrigo and Kamavinga are ready. And I just... Kamavinga continues to put in performance like that's this is three performances in a row where I look at these performances and I say to myself this is just like how Vinicius performed in his breakout season when he basically said I'm gonna be a starter these you can't put me on the bench with these types of performances and that's how Kamavinga's performed in these last three matches and I I just don't if he can if he can keep this going and he can keep this form consistent then I think you have to you have to find a way to fit him in. And then you've got a guy like Rodrigo who this isn't the first time he's just had the individual quality to pull something out of nothing. We talk about that with Real Madrid. Like you need players who in a blink of an eye can pull something out of out of the hat. And Rodrigo has done that now twice in the Copa del Rey. Um, just that little bit extra individual quality to to change a game, and it's it's hard to keep him on the bench much longer. So I just, I mean, I think I think we're coming to a point where even if the the transition's a little bit ahead of what we projected, maybe it's time to start implementing it. Well, let me also bring up this important little nugget <clears throat> because you mentioned, you know, like that Champions League run. We had the moments, we had the great performances, but we we had our midfield overran in all of those ties at some point or the other. And, and actually, in many cases, for the large majority of the 180 minutes and more with the extra time against Chelsea and City, there is also one key factor in those, those games. I'm looking at it now. Kamavinga, all of those times where even Modric tra- transcends, Kamavinga is on the field in the second half. Ceballos is on the field at that point. Lucas Vasquez, the subs have already made when we start making our comebacks. So it's not the, it's not the team that started those games, the Modric and Cruz lineups that actually were, were the reasons we, we won those ties. Yeah, yeah. That's so point, yeah. so, so that, that is an important little, little caveat in there. Um. Yeah, look, I I think there is enough data and eye tests telling us that there is a certain oomph to Real Madrid when these younger guys are on the field. 
and there's a certain energy and ability to take the t- the game to your opponent. And I don't even know if it's so much about second half or first half. The game state really matters for Carlo. Like to me, Carlo Ancelotti, Real Madrid are at their best when they're losing games and they're desperate. All of a sudden, they start to they start to counter press and control the ball. In that second half against Atletico, we had no choice. We started to actually keep possession in the final third. Watching Ceballos just made me want to go outside and do some sprints. I'm like I was pumped. The guy was winning these balls that I couldn't believe it. Like he, every time we lost the ball, he would pop up. Doesn't matter where it was on the field. He would just pop, pop up. Oh, Ceballos interception again. Here we go. Just winning the ball in the final third. It was incredible to watch that energy. I think Ram Madrid really, really benefits from having this this on the field. It's like a, just a jolt of electricity that reverberates throughout the entire team. It's like there's a collective nervous system. They all feel it. They all spring into action. It's 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 great to see. 